Danny, it's good to have you on. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Cool. So Danny Ryan is with us um, for the Ethereum Foundation, and we'll talk about Ethereum too in a bit. And we also have a special guest co-host today, um, Martin Kappelmann from Gnosis. Yeah, good to be here. I'm looking forward to learn more. Cool. Before we dive right in, um, let me tell you about our sponsors. Our first sponsor is Solana. Solana is a next generation blockchain with lightning fast blocks and fees less than a cent per transaction. Scalability is perhaps the single biggest challenge preventing crypto from becoming the backbone of the world's financial system. And today, Solana may well be the best solution we have. Go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. We would also like to th thank Exodus. Exodus is an easy to use wallet which supports hundreds of assets and has native apps for all platforms including iOS and Android. And as a fully non-custodial wallet, they are firm believers in the not your keys, not your coins mantra. Go to exodus.com and give it a try. Paraswap just came out with a huge update that's even faster and more liquid. It's cheaper than Uniswap and comes with a new gas token that can cut your gas fees by up to 50%. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. Start trading at paraswap.io slash epicenter. Cool. Danny, it's so good to have you on. Um, we've been meaning to do this episode for a super long time. It's been way overdue. And uh, just before the podcast, we kind of talked about the outline and uh, it was definitely uh, enough stuff to actually fill at least two episodes. Yeah. <laughs> so Danny, before we, before we dive into the protocol. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What brought you to the Ethereum Foundation? What did you do before? What piqued your interest in blockchain? I Honestly, it's, it's an honor to be here. I um, Early on in my blockchain journey, I remember listening to, to Epicenter and kind of gobbling up all of the content. So it's cool to be on the other side of that right now. How did I get here? It, it, it's a similar story to most, I think, honestly. I, I used to be a freelance software developer uh, for many years. I, I graduated college and was like, I really didn't want to work at a normal job. I didn't want to work in an office. I didn't want to live in San Francisco, all that. So I, I moved to New Orleans and was just kind of like helping small businesses with weird software software solutions. Um, and that was fun. Did that for many years. And then I think I started paying attention to Ethereum around the DAO, pre-DAO hack. Uh, someone sent me an article. I think it was in the New York Times. It was like all this money is being raised for this weird thing. Uh, and that, that piqued my interest. I had heard about Ethereum before and I hadn't realized that it actually launched. And I started paying attention. Um, and, and the DAO in particular, I know it was a fantastic disaster, but the fact that that could exist and was happening um, really, I think, allowed me to see and start to process what these tech, this technology uh, could do. So... I guess that was about 2016. I became more and more obsessed. At the beginning of 2017, I realized that it's all I wanted to think about and all I wanted to do. So I got rid of all of my freelance clients and I said, I'm going to figure out how to make this my job. Uh, on the journey of how do I actually make this my livelihood, I, I heard of this proof of stake thing and I, I, I thought to myself, okay, well, this doesn't make any sense. This is never going to work. A couple of weeks later, I'm like, okay, this makes sense. This is interesting. Uh, but how can I, you know, how can I make this a business? Can I do something with this uh, to make this my livelihood? And I'm like, okay, I, I could probably make like a staking pool. So I started reading all about uh, proof of stake and all about how it was going to work and all that kind of stuff in 2017, thinking that I could I could make a staking pool. Um, then I realized there was still work to do. <laughs> um, so I started helping out with some of the work here and there, uh, like contributing to the research where I could and um, like helping out with testing and various things on, on, online. So come come end of 2017, I had been collaborating on the internet uh, with various contributors. I had been working on some like testing infrastructure for Casper FFG, different things. And um, the EF was like, hey, do you want to join? Uh, we have plenty of work to do. So I joined the EF at the beginning of 2018. And at that point, I thought we'd probably launch Proof of Stake in about like six, seven months. <laughs> Little did I know that I would still be working on that very problem today. Um, and as we will discuss, we uh, Proof of Stake for Ethereum is live, but it's certainly not completed. Um, and so today I am still working on that very problem. <laughs> 
Super cool. Yeah, it's it's been a long time coming. So what what exactly do you do at the Ethereum Foundation? So I work on the research team and I do a mix of research, specification writing, and then a lot of like communication and coordination around those two things. Um, so the ETH2 project is consists of pe- many teams at the EF, uh, many external teams, um, ETH2 clients, whatever that may mean, ETH1 clients, um, and the intersection of all that. Uh, so I spent a lot of time communicating with engineers and helping people understand things and helping kind of coordinate and make sure the project keeps moving forward. Yeah, super cool. How many people are, are, are there working on ETH2 currently? Do you have any idea? Definitely over 100, uh, but it, it, there's, there's five active ETH2 client teams of varying size, um, there are probably 20 people at the EF that work on this stuff full time. There's people, plenty of people that work on it part time. Increasingly so as we approach the merge, which we'll talk about later, uh, what we call ETH1 clients um, are, are increasingly working on the merge uh, and working on ETH2. And so it's, it's uh, quite, quite a number of people. It must be difficult to coordinate because it, I mean, it's, it's kind of, um, th- there's so much of a research angle still to it. And I think uh, research is something that is not infinitely parallelizable, right? Right. And, you know, I'm one of probably many people that coordinate various things. Um, and it's, it's a very organic, um, open source effort. Um, and so the amount of coordination isn't incredibly high. Although at a certain, at the end of the day, we all need to talk to each other and we all need to like coalesce on, on single path and, and decisions. That, um, and so I try to help facilitate that. Then maybe let's uh, talk about the things that have been decided and kind of that are <laughs> life and kind of, yeah, basically tell us about the state of, um, yeah, phase zero or what, what, what is life and what is already working. So first, I'm going to answer what is what is ETH2 very broadly. And ETH2, it's definitely a bit of a misnomer, but we can go along with that term. Uh, it is a, a series of major uh, consensus upgrades for Ethereum aimed to make the protocol more secure, more sustainable, and more scalable. And at the core of that is the move from a proof of work consensus to a proof of stake consensus. Uh, so instead of securing the network with mining hardware and energy consumption, securing the network with the tokens itself, uh, the ether. And so at the core of that is the bootstrapping and the creation of this new consensus mechanism. And what, uh, as you mentioned, is live today is what we call phase zero. Uh, and that went live in December of 2020. And that was really the bootstrapping of this new proof of stake consensus mechanism that is called the beacon chain. So in December, um, tons of uh, Ethereum community members and different institutions uh, put a a bunch of Ether as capital and collateral into what we call the deposit contract and kickstarted this new consensus mechanism called the beacon chain. The beacon chain exists in parallel to the current Ethereum network. So in parallel to the proof of work network, which is still securing all of the assets and applications and contracts and accounts today. So we have on the one hand, the proof of work network chugging along. And on the other hand, this new consensus mechanism called the beacon chain existing in parallel to this um, building and securing itself. I think today there's something like 4.5 million ether uh, locked and secured in this uh, chain. I don't know what that's worth today. It depends on the, the minute and the hour. Uh, but this thing exists. This thing uh, finalizes itself. This thing builds itself. But ultimately what it does is it just builds and secures itself. And this is by design. This is an iterative path to get rid of the proof of work and to move uh, Ethereum mainnet to this new consensus mechanism. Obviously, Ethereum mainnet is used by tons of people, secures tons of value, um, and there's there's a lot at stake in this in this operation. And so what we've done is, is built it in parallel, uh, kind of vetted it in production, uh, done tons of tests uh, live. And now what we're working on is actually uh, the deprecation of the proof of work consensus mechanism in favor for uh, this live proof of stake consensus mechanism. So that's where we're at today. There is a proof of stake consensus mechanism bootstrapped live, securing tons of value, but really just kind of securing itself in isolation. 
then let's deep dive into what, what it exactly does. So uh, right now it comes to consensus on what? Um, it comes to consensus on itself. And it's by itself, um, what I mean is, is the proof of state consensus mechanism and all of the, the little gadgets and things in it. So it has a validator set. Um, each validator is worth approximately 32 ETH. So there's something like 140,000 validator entities in this consensus. Each one of them has like its own little state. It has its balance. Um, it has duties. It has like a job at any given time. It has randomness generation. It has information about finality. So which portions of the chain are finalized and would never be reverted. And it has a lot of just uh, various accounting between finality and, and kind of the head of the chain. Uh, so there's a number of, of operations related to the functionality of this chain. And those op operations are kind of what we call validator level transactions. So system level transactions. And really what it does is uh, there's, a, there's a core operation called attestations where validators are constantly signaling uh, what they see as uh, the head of the chain and what they see as their local state of the world. Um, and they use these messages to come to consensus with each other um, and ultimately drive this, this core like system layer of the chain. There's some other operations um, related to validator activity like deposits, onboarding new validators, exits, uh, leaving the validator set and a couple of other things. So really, really, it's like this, this, it's a proof of stake system. And there's a lot of different accounting, different little operations going on, and it builds and comes to consensus on itself. Let's get to our sponsor Solana. Now, this is a special ad for me to read because I've been a deep supporter of this project since meeting the Solana team back in 2018. I invest personally in the project and my company course one is super deeply involved in the Solana ecosystem, including running the biggest validator. So what's so cool about Solana? Well, we all know that scalability is the single most important issue facing the blockchain industry today. And the Solana blockchain is an amazing solution for it. The network supports thousands of transactions per second with 400 millisecond block times and over 500 validators. The special thing about Solana is also that it's not a sharded blockchain. It's a single blockchain hyper optimized for performance. So that makes it really easy to maintain composability between all of the apps on Solana so that they work together seamlessly now and forever. The Solana ecosystem is growing at a rapid pace and it's a great place to build your project or just get involved with the community. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. In principle, I can become a validator, right? So I need 32 ETH and what, what do I need to do then to, to become a staker? Yes. Anyone can become a validator if they um, have or accumulate 32 Ether. And what you do is there's a number of different tools, the different paths. There's this nice tool called Launchpad, which has a nice like user interface. Um, you can do this in, in a number of ways, but uh, you can go to Launchpad. Uh, you do a, a key generation step where you generate an active key. So the key that's going to sign attestations and build blocks and different things. Um, and then what we call a withdrawal credential, which is can be a cold key. It doesn't have to be on, on the machine. Um, and that ultimately owns the funds when the validator's done uh, with, with validation. And so what that validator, to become a validator, what you do is you take the 32 ETH, generate some keys, sign a deposit message, and send that ether to the deposit contract, which is a um, special contract on the current Ethereum mainnet on ETH1. Uh, you send it with this, this data, and then the beacon chain, which operates in parallel to that uh, proof of work network, uh, is listening to the deposit contract, coming to consensus on the state of the deposit contract, and inducting new deposits. So right now, it's kind of like a one-way bridge from the proof of work Ethereum into this new beacon chain. Um, once you have your validator deposit inducted into the beacon chain. Uh, there's a little bit of like process overhead, a little bit of time to, uh, that it takes in terms of come to consensus on this. Then you get a new validator record in the state of the beacon chain. Uh, the beacon state is like this kind of system layer state of this thing. Um, and after a number of epochs, something like four epochs, each epoch 6.4 minutes, um, you then become activated. And at that point, your validator now, each epoch will have uh, w at least one, if not a number of duties with respect to the, the beacon chain. Um, and they, they get little assignments and they listen to the network and sign messages and talk to each other and, and come to consensus on things. I, I want to directly ask about the, the deposit contract because 
the, the premise so far was that the, the two things are uh, living in parallel, but that is al already obviously a connection. So uh, apparently you need, or the East 2 chain needs to read from the East 1 chain and kind of needs to understand the East 1 chain. So does that mean that to run a East 2 validator, you also need to run an East 1 client? Or, or otherwise, how would you know uh, that this deposit happened? Right. So yes, there is a one-way and very restricted bridge from the ETH1 chain into the Beacon chain. And um, as a validator, you are running the Beacon chain, which is actually relatively lightweight, um, and running the Ethereum 1 proof-of-work network. This is to be able to listen primarily to that deposit contract uh, and be able to build and connect that bridge. Uh, to bootstrap this consensus mechanism, which is the crypto economic consensus mechanism based off of Ether, uh, you do need Ether. Um, and so that link is, is critical for uh, the bootstrapping and functioning of the system. As a validator, you do have these two pieces of software that you're running in parallel and communicate with each other. Um, and this actually is, is kind of representative of what the system would look like after the merge. So once these systems are unified, you similarly would have to run the beacon chain, which is kind of the system level, level state, as well as a piece of software that will give you access into the execution layer, into the things that we know and love, uh, essentially like geth minus proof of work plus beacon chain. I assume it's uh, incentivized to be a validator. So what do I get if um, I get to build a block and how is it determined if and when I get to build one? Mm -hmm. So there's two primary actions that are rewarded for the validator. And uh, one is this action called a testing, which you are assigned to a test exactly once per epoch, so exactly once per 6.4 minutes. Um, and this accounts for actually seven eighths of your uh, validation reward. So it's the majority of, of the issuance goes to this very regular interval activity. Uh, which is nice. Uh, there, there's a reason for this because it helps with um, kind of hardening the fork choice and keeping things very stable because many validators get to, even though only one validator at any given slot is producing a block, many validators get to throw in their weight and say what the head is. So it makes it very difficult for these like this monopolistic activity of producing a block to be able to uh, reorg and, and, and do different attacks. And it's also nice because it really smooths out rewards. Whereas in in proof of work, you're rolling the dice over and over and over again. And every once in a while, you randomly get a chance to produce a block and get a big payout. Whereas in this proof of stake system, the rewards and payouts are very, very much more regularized, even if you have just say one validator. So attestations uh, are this like very critical uh, message type for securing uh, the head of the chain and, and finalizing things. But then, as you said, uh, this other very critical role um, is actually producing a block. And so based off your validator assignments, which is based off of randomness gener uh, generation on chain, which we can talk a little bit about, every single slot, there is exactly one validator assigned to produce a block. A slot is every 12 seconds. It's kind of like the heartbeat of the system. So instead of this stochastic process of mining, which randomly there's a target uh, for block time and uh, randomly blocks get produced kind of around that target. Instead, there's this uh, click of every 12 seconds. Blocks can be produced if the proposer shows up. And every single 12 seconds, a producer, a validator is assigned. And so if it's your, say it's slot 10,001, uh, you had a little bit of look ahead, say um, you had 32 slots in advance, you knew that you were going to produce a block. So you're listening to the chain and you listen for valuable things to include in your block and you build off of the parent and produce a block and broadcast the network. Valuable things today are primarily just these validator operations. So attestations and deposits and things like that. But post merge, you would also be including user land, application layer transactions um, and seeking to like maximize uh, transaction revenue like, like miners do today. Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet, and that is so critical. Because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. 
They're old school and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus, so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets. And from within Exodus, you can easily change one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat, and they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus for their amazing support of Epicenter. So what happens if, if uh, for some reason, the, the um, validator that is assigned to this block or slot doesn't show up? Um, a slot can be skipped. So in the, in the normal case, this looks just kind of like a, a longer block time. Uh, for example, sometimes we have like, just based on the stochastic process and proof of work, like sometimes you have blocks that happen in 10 seconds, sometimes you have blocks that happen in 30 seconds. Uh, so in the event that a slot was skipped, you would have uh, 24 seconds in between the slot time. And that would look like a, a slight reduction in capacity of the chain for that given time. Uh, interestingly, with like 1559, fee mechanics and, and variable block sizes that can kind of like be self-balancing in the in the average. Um, but what we've seen in the live system is something like a 99.5% uh, participation rate with respect to blocks and attestations. Um, so in the normal operation of the chain, so not crazy global latencies or uh, not some attack scenario or major failure in a client, um, we, we expect to see almost all the time, a block every 12 seconds. So you said 99.5% for both the... Uh, Attestations and the blocks, yeah. All right, okay. And do I get slashed if I don't show up or if I don't attest? So I, we reserve the word slashing for uh, very explicitly malicious activities um, and what can be more severe penalties. So in the normal operation, we have rewards, and we have penalties. And so you have this 32 ETH stake. And if you do uh, your job well, you can be rewarded. And if you don't do your job or you like are fail you're trying to do your job and you can't quite find the head of the chain, you might instead lose a small amount of ether. And so in normal operation, if you, and this is variable depending on the validator, the size of the validator set, uh, but in normal operation, in a year, you might make anywhere from like 6 to 12% return on that, that 32 ETH uh, deposit. Whereas if you were offline the entire time, uh, you, your penalties would equal approximately what you could have made. So you actually, instead of uh, making 6% that year, you would have lost 6% that year. And that's not just opportunity cost. You would have actually been penalized a little bit and seen a linear decrease in your stake. And so that's Rewards and penalties. For all the basic activities, you can either receive rewards or you can be slightly penalized uh, if you aren't able to, to perform your job. There's individual ones and there's also group. So like if the, the amount of your attestation reward would actually scale with this like group mechanic. So if like 100% of the validators are online, you can receive maximal uh, validator reward. But if only 80% of the validators are online, um, you would actually only get you know, 0.8 of your total attestation reward. And this is so that uh, there's this like incentive one to not like dosh your neighbors um, and take them down so you can get their rewards instead. Uh, and also in the event of crisis, uh, there's this group, this group dynamic so that you want to figure out what the hell is going on and try to fix the network. So those are rewards and penalties. You did bring up slashing. Slashing is actually, um, it is a penalty, but it's a much more severe penalty. And it's in relation to these explicitly cryptographically provable nefarious activities. So for example, you're assigned to attest every epoch. This is very important for the operation of the chain. This helps finalize things. Uh, this helps secure the head of the chain and the fork choice. Um, and you're only supposed to do it once per epoch. If instead you do it twice per epoch, you can be slashed because this is an activity that could lead to, lead to a network fault. Essentially, the idea is in proof of work, um, you have a physical real world piece of hardware uh, that you can only point to one chain or another. So one fork or another. Um, and or you could split it. You could do 50% on that fork of the energy on that fork, 50% on the, on the other fork. But you cannot put 100% 
onto fork A and 100% onto fork B. Whereas in, in proof of stake, that economic asset is actually just related to you signing messages. Signing messages is really cheap. And so the idea here is that messages that can lead to you attempting to apply your stake in multiple places uh, and could lead to network faults and confusion as to what the head of the chain is, we have to make those messages expensive. Uh, similarly to how allocating your physical resources, uh, the mining hardware was expensive. And so thus, if you do some of these activities where you're essentially signaling two different uh, versions of a history, um, you can be penalized severely because they're provably nefarious messages. Uh, and that's what is called slashing. By severe, I mean that if enough validators were doing that type of like double signaling within um, a recent window of time uh, to create a network fault and that minimum threshold is one third of the validators, uh, then you'd be punished maximally. So if one third of the validator set is doing slashable things within a, a recent time window, um, then those validators actually lose 100% of their stake. And that's because we want to um, have like provable security bounds uh, based off of, you know, if and when uh, attacks happen. Whereas if you're, if this is just like an isolated event, say I'm just running a single validator, um, I do something uh, ill-advised with my staking setup and I'm signing double messages uh, by accident, then, and but no one else has really been doing it in the recent time window, I get a slap on the wrist, I get kicked out of the validator set, but since the fraction of validators that have been slashed recently is very low, uh, my penalty is like still relatively low. I might lose like one ETH um, and get kicked out of the validator set. So that's, so we have rewards, we have penalties for normal operation and we have slashing, which is for these like very explicit uh, nefarious activities like double signing attestations or producing two blocks in the same slot, that kind of stuff. Yeah, talking about slashing, is there a chance to do uh, to do something that's yeah offend offendable to the level that you get slashed uh, by accident? So concretely, uh, well, we have multiple client implementations. So, well, there might be the situation that one client uh, says, well, that is a valid block. Uh, and another client says that's not a valid block and therefore is kind of ignoring that and uh, proposing another one? We have seen some uh, a number of slashings on mainnet since December. And almost all of these have been due to individuals and institutions creating um, sophisticated and attempted to be sophisticated redundancy setups. So essentially, it's very, if you have your keys in one place and you're tracking the messages that you've signed, it's very simple. It's very, the logic is, can be, uh, you know, in, in six lines of code. It's very simple to like not double sign. Um, essentially, uh, the, the, a couple of conditionals uh, and a very, very small database, and I can prevent myself from doing this. But if I have my keys in two locations, say I'm, I'm trying to run client A and client B, and I'm trying to run them on two machines to make sure that I don't have any downtime, then I'm going to be signing double messages. Um, almost every epoch, and I'm going to almost certainly be slashed. And so this is actually what we've seen is we've seen some hobbyists that didn't didn't get the memo and are trying to make sure they don't have any downtime. Uh, they've been a couple of them have been slashed. But actually, what we've seen more so is, is these institutions who want to advertise, you know, the best uptime ever. And what they do is they have like way too sophisticated of uh, deploys and, and don't manage the keys properly and have the keys in two different locations. That's the key. If you have your keys in two different locations and they both think they're in charge and they're, uh, you know, there's no communication there, you're going to be slashed because you're going to like eventually have a slightly different worldview. Like one, block, one client might see the block, the other client might not see the block and they both will sign something different. So basically your advice is not, don't do it too complicated. Keep it, simple. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Yeah. Because if you're offline, even for a day, like you're going to lose very, very little money. Because again, we have rewards and penalties for normal operation. You, you, if you're offline for a whole year, you might lose like 8%. Whereas if you, if you like do too complex of a setup, you're going to, uh, you know, you will lose much, you, will, you can lose much more than that. So there's many client teams um, and a number of them have implemented this new feature uh, called doppelganger detection. Superfizz came up with it and Superfizz from the East Acre community. And he, um, the idea is where, right when you turn on uh, your client and it knows that there's some validator keys associated with it, it actually won't start its job immediately. It'll wait like an epoch or two and just listen to the network. 
and it knows that it's not signing anything and it's not broadcasting anything. So if it sees any messages come in from itself, it's detected a doppelganger and it says, oh no, abort, abort, don't sign any messages. Um, and this is actually a new feature that's rolled out a number of clients. And I think it's protecting, especially, especially the hobbyists with the simple setups. Obviously, then you have like an epoch or two of extra downtime. But like I said, downtime's not the issue. It's really like double signing is like this severely uh, worse activity. And so I think you can like manually override. You can do like a flag that's like dash dash capital letters unsafe disable doppelganger detection. Uh, but for most users, they should just run with the run with the default um, and, and have those protections. So when you're looking for a flight, you go to a flight aggregator to see all the different places where you can buy the flight, to get all the options and make sure you get the best price for your travel plans. And when you're making a DeFi swap, just do the same and use Paraswap. It beats the market prices across all the major DEXs because it aggregates them. And thanks to their network of professional market makers, you get zero slippage on your trades. So they just pushed a huge update that's even faster, more liquid, thanks to a brand new algorithm. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. So go and check it out. Give Paraswap a try at paraswap.io slash epicenter. You've referred to epochs repeatedly now. So maybe let's talk about that because that's something we don't have on ETH1. So what is an epoch and how, how does it relate to finality? So an epoch is a collection of 32 slots. Like I said, slots are every 12 seconds. So an epoch is every 6.4 minutes. Slots are this unit of time at which blocks and very granular actions can happen. Whereas epochs is like a collection of slots and there's like a, an aggregate of duties and different accounting that happen at each epoch. And so every epoch is 32 slots. Every validator is assigned to attest to exactly one slot per epoch. And so an epoch in advance, my validator client gets notified that, okay, at the sixth slot into the next epoch, you're going to have to attest to the head. So at that point, you'll, you'll, bro you'll sign a message and broadcast an attestation. And similarly, like within an epoch, you'll be, you can potentially be assigned to a block. And so all the, valid the entire validator set has this one attestation per epoch. Um, and thus at the end of an epoch is kind of the, when accounting is done. So in the previous epoch, uh, we go and look, okay, how many attestations were there? Uh, was there agreement? Was there disagreement? What are the rewards and penalties based off of like the individual and the aggregate activity? Um, and is there enough consensus, um, on the state of things to update the finality calculations? An epoch can first be justified and then be finalized. Justification is kind of like this first round of signaling for validators to say, I think that this block will remain in the chain forever. And then once something's justified, uh, they can signal a deeper thought, which is, okay, let's now say this, this block will uh, remain in the chain forever. And so what we have is this like two epoch finality cycle, where at the end of epoch, at the end of epoch n, you might justify it. And at the end of epoch n plus one, you might finalize, uh, optimally finalize epoch n. Um, and in, in mainnet, I think we see like pretty much every single epoch just kind of goes through that cycle of justification, then finality, justification, then finality. And that's also at these epoch boundaries is where a lot of like rewards accounting happens and, and various other things. Like you might also at that point, update what the view of the, the ETH1 chain is so that you can pro induct due deposits and different things. So it's really like, it's these accounting boundaries. It's, it's really these larger than block groupings of logical activity. And, and from, from a finality standpoint, uh, you can really think about, you have all these little blocks, but you can think about these epochs as more of like larger packages. It's kind of like the meta chain on top of the little, the little mini chain. Does it mean the maximum kind of uh, reorg that could happen is like one epoch or two epochs or is that a, one way to think about it? So there's like increasing depth and probability of reorgs in the ETH2 beacon chain. And at every slot, uh, a validator first creates a block and then one thirty second of the validator set is uh, at, during that slot, because they're, they're assigned to that slot, will then send an attestation. That attestation immediately gives weight to people's fork choice um, and recursively gives weight to the, to the chain prior. And so actually, because of the way that 
uh, the validator set, much of the validator set participates each slot, um, you end up with uh, probabilistic guarantees at the depth of slots that the chain will be reorged. So it's something, it, it feels a little bit like proof, proof of work at the chain tip, where there's you can make probabilistic claims that there won't be a reorg unless X, Y, Z happens. Um, and under normal operation, those probabilistic claims are actually very, very strong uh, because most of the validator set is participating and sending signal at each slot. Then at the depth of one epoch, you can have justified. So something 32 slots ago uh, can be justified. And this is really, this is like, the, like I said, the first step in finality. Justification, you can make a much stronger claim that something justified would never be reorged uh, because it would require a very large amount of, of validators call it at least one third, likely more in the one half, even two thirds uh, realm to not run the protocol. So it's essentially to run a, an altered version of the protocol where they stop listening to justifications. Uh, because once something's justified locally, you say, that's what I want to build on. Um, and something won't be uh, elsewise justified unless people like change their, their local protocol. Granted, that wouldn't necessarily do a slashing, uh, but it's, it becomes very, very uh, unlikely. Then at the depth of two epochs, so 30, uh, 64 slots or 12.8 uh, minutes, then you can finalize. Um, and this is this means that locally in my software, whoever's seen that 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 is finalized would never uh, revert. And you can make claims that no one will see a different version of finality unless a minimum threshold of validators were slashed. Um, and that minimum threshold is one third. Um, one third is actually, although theoretical uh, attack could happen at one third, uh, it's extremely improbable that you could even conduct it at one third and probably be much, much higher. Um, and so you can make crypto economic claims that this is finalized, this will remain finalized, and nobody else will see a different version of finality um, unless a large amount of capital is burned. And so we have, again, we have like the head of the chain, we get to make probabilistic claims uh, based off of all these attestations that things won't be reorged. Um, then 32 slots, we get justification, which, you know, for almost any operation is uh, much, is enough uh, depth and enough confirmation. And then at 64 slots, we get that, uh, that finality, which is like that ultimate claim of crypto economic, like it's not going to revert. Yeah, that, that sounds to me like like just very high level on proof of work. It's kind of totally normal and totally expected that it happens multiple times a day that a single block or even two blocks get get reverted. Here, it sounds like even a single yeah block or slot revert uh, would be highly unlikely in normal in normal operations. Yeah, in normal operation, absolutely. So if I saw like ninety nine percent of the slot attestations come in, um, I can make like. I can I can be pretty well assured that this is not going to revert unless there's actually something malicious going on. If instead I saw 10% of those that slots attestations come in, then I wouldn't I wouldn't start locally making decisions necessarily because the, I don't have like a high probabilistic guarantee. But in normal operation, we do see almost all validators assigned to each slot attesting uh, each slot, and and thus we do get that like probabilistic uh, increase in the probabilistic guarantee that things won't be reverted. Yeah, so so it's probably in, in normal operation, as good as proof of work confirmations, um, and then increasing depth, uh, increasing kind of crypto economic guarantees of non-reversion. But on a very fundamental level, this is still very different from ETH1, right? Because on ETH1, one of the general design decisions is of availability over consistency. So basically the, the chain can never halt. But uh, this comes at the cost that there might be reorgs, right? So, and then you have like the the, the converse with, uh, with BFT style consensus algorithms that uh, return uh, basically they they have finality, but in principle the chain can halt. So very much like on tendermint. It seems like ETH two does something A weird hybrid. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it has this weird hybrid or this this middle ground that I didn't even know existed beforehand. So, what are the trade offs of having like this this hybrid model? Right. So, like proof of work consensus, the ETH two protocol is fundamentally liveness favoring, meaning that the chain can be built even if you don't have these like BFT thresholds of validators. Um, and this is to provide kind of the uptime and availability of the network that blockchain users and what I think a, a global decentralized network expects. 
at that point, uh, it's all, it's ultimately up to local node operators to make decisions about what is accepted. Like if, if I'm an exchange, I might always only operate under finality, but if I'm like sending NFTs to my buddy and like, we don't have finality, I know that this, this operation will clear and, and it's, it's not a big deal. So what we get here is really like we get a live chain and we get a BFT consensus kind of like following. And so from the perspective of the designers of V2, that's kind of at least for the expectations of guarantees of blockchain systems, um, a really nice compromise. And the idea ultimately is a safety favoring chain cannot simulate a liveness favoring chain. Whereas a liveness favoring chain can simulate a safety favoring chain. And thus the latter is ultimately like a more powerful construction because it gives more optionality to users on how to interpret the worldview at any given time. There's much debate on this point uh, and as to like what the quality of service can or should be um, and whether it's really worth having these like live chains uh, without finality. But again, that point ultimately is is like the 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 clicking point for me is really like, sure, if there's not finality, I don't have to finalize anything. But I do provide optionality to users and systems uh, based off of like probabilistic guarantees and different things um, in a liveness favoring system. Ah, super interesting. So maybe let's talk about the merge for a little bit. There will be the merge, and the merge um, will merge ETH1 into the beacon chain. Um, so how exactly does that happen? When is it going to happen? I imagine ETH1 and ETH2 have separate states. How is that handled? How do you, how do you kind of make them congruent? So let's think about what ETH1 is. ETH1 is, and this is a, a construction for, uh, ETH1 is a lot of things, and there's a lot of different ways to think about it. But for the purposes of the merge, we can think about it in two layers. We have this application layer or this execution layer uh, where all of the users hang out. It's where all the applications are. It's where the user layer state is. It's where transactions are being processed and all that. It's really like what I as an end user care about. I care about you know, my Uniswap trades and that kind of stuff. And then you have this thin proof of work consensus module that's driving it. It's really like providing the service. It's providing the quality, the, the um It's providing the service to this execution layer. It's, it's the cradle for blocks. It's providing guarantees about reorgs and, and different things like that. And what we have uh, is, is really these two layers. We have the proof of work consensus layer uh, providing the application layer to services um, and to users. And then what we've bootstrapped in production today is the speaking chain, which is a, a proof of state consensus. And the idea really here is for at one point in time, uh, the proof of work module to be driving that application layer. And at the next point in time, post merge, that proof of stake module, that beacon chain to be driving the same execution layer, the same application layer. Um, and so the, the transactions, the, essentially the cradle of Ethereum right now is these like proof of work blocks and that proof of work consensus. And post-merge, the cradle of Ethereum, the thing holding it all together, is ultimately the beacon chain and the proof of stake consensus. And you can imagine the essentially that that payload for the execution layer is essentially moving locations uh, upon some condition. And so people are running software that knows prior to this time or prior to this block height, I'm listening to the miners. And after this time, I'm listening to the proof of stake validators. Um, and there's there's like a number of little details to work through on the actual point of merge and how uh, you maybe handle attacks on this boundary and reorgs on this boundary. But the, the simple case is essentially you have a chain being built by proof of work um, at one point in time. And that same chain, that same like payload of execution layer that uh, validated that end users care about is then being built by these, by these validators. And the nice thing is conceptually these, these layers um, are important from like a, mechanism design standpoint, but they actually translate into um, really nice like software reuse. And so we have uh, what we call ETH2 clients, which are uh, these beacon chain clients. They've built a highly sophisticated uh, proof of stake consensus mechanism. And then we have like, what is an ETH1 client? An ETH1 client really is a highly sophisticated execution layer. It's highly sophisticated EVM, transaction processing, 
you know, mempool management and all that kind of stuff. Plus this thin proof of work module that like literally hasn't been touched since day zero. Um, it, it's, it's a relatively simple mechanism from the software perspective and it hasn't been, it hasn't been touched. And so what the software after the merge looks like is really taking an ETH1 client, which is primarily a highly sophisticated execution layer, cutting out that proof of work uh, module, which is was the driver of that execution layer. And instead of listening to that proof of work module, listening to an ETH2 client. And so the, the, the software post-merge actually looks like you take these ETH2 clients, which are highly sophisticated proof of stake consensus mechanisms, and you take an ETH1 client, which is a highly sophisticated execution layer, and you smash them together, and you have the proof of stake client driving that execution layer, um, asking questions about the execution layer. So for example, instead of the proof of work module saying, hey, give me a give me a, a valuable transaction bundle to include this block, the beacon chain client is instead saying, hey, Geth, hey, Nethermind, hey, Open Ethereum, um, my, my local adjunct execution engine, give me, the, give me the valuable payload. Hey, process this payload and that kind of stuff. You, you mentioned, so there's a state before and there's a state after. Really, that state, there's, there's a beacon state, which is like the system layer state of this proof of state consensus mechanism. And then there's the application layer state that exists in these, in these like proof of work blocks today. And really, uh, this consensus mechanism is really good at, at, at doing that. It's really good at coming to consensus on things. And so it's really just like slotting in in its state transition and in its, uh, in its state, it's embedding the execution layer state of Ethereum into that. And so if you think about it as like a tree of, of all the things embedded in the, the beacon chain outer layer state that is built and finalized, you're essentially having like the uh, application layer of Ethereum is embedded into it as like a subcomponent of its state. And so that application layer state right now exists in like the proof of work land. Um, and it's really just taking that application layer state and subsuming it into the, the beacon state, which when you finalize the outer state root of the beacon state, um, you finalize everything within it. And so you then just, if, if within it is the application layer state uh, that's been consensus on, then you get, you know, these finality properties and the other properties that uh, proof of stake is giving to itself. So you're kind of spooning over the state, but I mean, in principle, the miners can continue with um, the original chain, right? So basically this is kind of a natural breakpoint for a fork. Yeah, I mean, it's it's if anybody wants to run proof of work Ethereum, uh, I think blockchain governments go governance ultimately works is that anyone can continue to run it. Um, there's a couple of things that I think uh, might make it not super viable. The Ethereum community has consistently since Genesis put this thing in called the difficulty bomb. The difficulty bomb was intended to ultimately at the beginning to to allow for a, a cleaner shift to proof of stake um, ultimately like the mining difficulty at these points of the difficulty bomb uh, increases exponentially so that it becomes non-viable to mine that proof of work chain unless you actually hard fork so that might dissuade a proof of work fork here but another another interesting point is that when in the last contentious ethereum hard fork so w which created ethereum classic there wasn't a lot going on in the application layer. Uh, there really was this DAO thing and then a bunch of like little experiments. And so the application layers could kind of fork and exist in parallel and, and it wouldn't, it didn't really, you know, there, there wasn't like any of these like big dependencies and stuff. Whereas I would posit that if Ethereum forked today and you had a majority community stake in one and then a minority community stake in the other, that the application layer on the minority one is likely going to implode. Um, there's a lot of like interdependencies and a lot of value and stuff here. Uh, for example, oracles may or may not be run on the minority fork. Um, and even if they are, you have systems like um, Maker, which if they're if the, the value of the ETH on one side or the other uh, drops significantly, you have like mass liquidations, then DAI is integrated all into DeFi and you have rippling. And all, all the all the uh, backed assets like USDC, Tether and so on. So yeah, I, I also think like the the uh, the support for proof of stake in the Ethereum community is so overwhelming that I, I really don't think there will be any debate or any question uh, kind of what's yeah, the right yeah. chain. I, or, I, I, definitely from a community perspective, I'm like, 
99.99% are just like, let's do this. We've been wanting to do this for years. Can we just do this? Come on. Um, whereas you, you could theoretically run a proof of work fork, but I think that uh, it will quickly become a wasteland. <laughs> You said earlier that uh, proof of stake um, has two main reasons behind it. So one is the environmental sustainability, and I think that's pretty straightforward um, why that is the case. And the other one is the security. So let's talk about the security aspect. Why is proof of stake good for security purposes? So proof of work and proof of stake are fundamentally crypto economic consensus mechanisms, meaning that they have certain properties if uh, no entity has certain thresholds of, of value uh, securing the network. Um, and so they're, they're pretty similar in that sense and have uh, some similar properties because of it. But I think the, the crux of the uh, proof of stake having higher security is really because that asset securing the network is actually in the protocol. And so you can not only reward that asset, but you can penalize that asset. Um, and this, especially in the failure modes, uh, leads to much more secure system. And so let's think about what happens if a proof of work chain is 51% attacked. If a proof of work chain is 51% attacked, that's kind of it. Like you have a, you have a party that has 51% of the assets and they can reorg and do whatever they want. There, the only recourse here is uh, forking the protocol so that you have a new mining algorithm, uh, at which point you bricked all the good guys' hardware as well. You can think about it as there's a, a budget for the attack. The budget for the attack was securing 51% of the assets, but then there ultimately really wasn't a cost. And so once I secured the budget, I'm now just God. Whereas in proof of stake, because those assets are in the protocol, there's a budget so secure 51% of those assets. But then there's ultimately a cost as well, because if, uh, if you do commit a network fault, then those assets are slashed. So I can do the attack once, and then I lost all my money. And then I have to accumulate all those assets again, and I can do the attack again. You know, whereas in proof of work, I just entered God mode and, and could reorg over and over again. And in the extreme where you're some say maybe hit like two thirds threshold um, and you're some sort of like censoring majority or cartel, uh, this can also be detected uh, socially. So I can, I can identify this cartel, this censoring majority and in, in the extreme, there can even be social recovery. So these assets could be forked out of the protocol and burned. Um, whereas in proof of work, uh, you don't have this nuance and you, the only, the only recourse was ultimately uh, forking the good guys and the bad guys out. Uh, that's definitely like uh, something, a failure mode you don't want to run into. But the fact that that recovery does exist, I think it ultimately would dissuade even those extreme types of attacks. Yeah, I mean, this is a question about what is more secure. I think the debate uh, well, was going on for years. And I think, I really think it's settled now. I, <laughs> I really think uh, proof of stake is it, it's, it's absolutely clear. One thing where it's way less clear to me how it will play out uh, is the question of um, centralization. Because originally I used to bring up the argument that um, proof of stake would lead to less centralization uh, than proof of work, because in proof of work, you have the economy of scale. So you have, uh, if, if you spend, I don't know, uh, 10 million on mining, you will get the, at the end a better return for your last dollar than someone who just spends a thousand dollar on mining. Uh, while with proof of um, stake, arguably, or, well, maybe that, that, that is uh, less the case and kind of each validator, even if you just have like one validator, you kind of probably will have the same rewards. That being said, there are significant arguments, I would say, also for uh, centralization in proof of stake. And that is likely the idea of staking der derivatives. Uh, and I mean, to some extent, that's already what we are seeing is that, of course, uh, yeah, there are specifically now where you cannot get your ESER, uh, well, immediately out. So, so it's quite quite a commitment to to do it uh, manually or to do it yourself, kind of stake your 32 ESER. You could just go to an exchange and they will offer you a nice service. They will say, okay, well, if you want to go out, well, we find a seller for you. We we create a well staking derivative or whatever we call or a these market, two. Yeah, yeah, and, and and we have a market for that. And of course, to someone, to, to an individual, I mean, that, that's, that's a big, big plus. 
but that comes at the cost of um yeah or, well or it, it threatens uh, the decentralization and I, I maybe you know better than me the current statistics but exchanges play already a big role right Right. I mean, between exchanges and staking pools, it's probably something like 50, 55% of staked assets that we can tell today. Um, there is a, a definitely a strong hobbyist community. And, but you're right, like this, there's this like before the merge, there's this, this unknown lockup. And so uh, liquidity is certainly a question and certainly uh, a driving factor for people to move to these, um, these other types of institutions. Is there anything we can do about it? <laughs> <laughs> so there are some things that, are done uh, today. So one thing uh, I, I mentioned earlier, this is this is kind of a minor point, but the fact that you can participate with a very small percentage of the network and still have regular rewards and payouts, that's like a nice little thing. Um, and that helps the hobbyist community. One thing that is designed into proof of stake systems, which is not uh, in proof of work systems, is there's these like discorrelation incentives. And so if you are with a, a majority if you're with a, a very large staking institution um, and they go offline, the amount that you lose is, is much higher than if you were going offline in isolation or in even a smaller pool. Even worse is if you're with one of these large institutions um, and they have some sort of security breach or some sort of bug or issue uh, then that causes them to be slashed. Then again, the amount that you're slashed scales with the percentage of the network that was recently slashed. And so if you're with like a 30% staking pool uh, or 30% staking provider exchange that has uh, you know, a major slashing event, say somebody internal uh, just wants to watch the world burn or somebody hacks the system or they're running just buggy software or some one of the, you know, trying to be clever with their redundancy, um, you, know, you, you would lose quite a bit of capital. And so there are these disincentives to being with the large institutions. Um, this might drive you to be a hobbyist and stake at home, but this also might drive you to be uh, you know, with a smaller pool. And so I think even if we end up with a highly pooled landscape, which we certainly are, are beginning to see, at least in the 50% range, there's still these, these incentives to not be with, with the mega players. And so whereas in mining, I think we have like two or three pools uh, that you, know, you add them together and you're at 51%. Uh, the only thing that keeps those pools from being larger than that is, is because it's not socially tenable. Um, ultimately, like it wouldn't, it, you know, people don't want to join the, the pool that's too big. Whereas there's actually a disincentive of joining pools that are, that are that large in the staking landscape. It is unfortunate that those disincentives are in the tail risk scenarios, which I think that humans are pretty bad at really assessing tail risk. Um, and so I think we might, we might see waves of centralization and then decentralization as uh, some of these events happen. Uh, so, so if if something major happened to a major exchange, all of a sudden we might see everyone like scatter their stake and 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 redistribute. Uh, but but we shall see. Staking derivatives are certainly um, another interesting thing. I think we've seen there's a there's an entity that has something like seven percent of staked assets right now. And uh, I think that number has increased quite a bit in the past few months. And that's primarily because they offer, I won't use the word decentralized, but they offer, they offer an on-chain staking derivative. Um, and this, you know, they have an interesting mechanism where they're kind of distributing, they're kind of like this tokenized middleware that then like distributes to various pools. And so although it represents 7% of the stake, it's actually distributed to like 10 pools underneath the hood. Um, and then you have these staking derivatives that represent like kind of the, the shared risk across these these pools. Um, this is, I see as a, a competitor to exchanges rather than a, um, a competitor to, to hobbyists. Like if I'm a hobbyist, I'll probably be a hobbyist. Whereas if, uh, you know, I was going to go to Coinbase, I might instead go with this like decentralized option. I hope that we see a number of these. Uh, so we see a lot of competition and I hope that we see a number of like staking institutions. So we see a lot of competition. I am more optimistic probably than you, you led um, in terms of the, although we might see like a highly pooled and highly institutionalized space, um, I think we're going to see much better properties than we've seen um, with mining pools. I mean, one, one is that e every exchange wants to get in on the action. So every exchange is probably going to create a product. Whereas mining pools, we saw, saw very few entities that ultimately are these like very large pools. Yeah, one, one argument you brought that is definitely very strong is just this continuous payout. I mean, that, that was definitely a driving factor for mining pools in, uh, well, in, in, in proof of work. Uh, how is that affected uh, after the merge? Because then 
well, I guess we are talking about transaction fees. Do they go then to the block, uh, to the block producer, or at least probably MEV will go to the block producer? So, yeah, how so, would you so think that will affect the value of the payload of the application layer payload? So the transactions that we know and love goes to the block producer. They're the sole uh, entity responsible for bundling and finding that that value, and so they're the ones that are paid out. This actually is is definitely like a especially in the like ever evolving landscape of MEV. Um, this is definitely like a huge point of, of research and a huge point of discussion. Uh, and ultimately, I think it comes down to uh, the democratization of MEV, meaning uh, who has access to it, uh, how much of an edge do institutional players have over hobbyists. Um, and and I, ultimately, I think it's very important for one, for application layer uh, contracts to design their systems so they don't have highly exploitable MEV, um, and two, for tool open tools uh, and open access to MEV to be created so that hobbyists uh, have don't have like um, a huge discount on institutions. Um, and three, uh, even investigation of uh, layer one protocol techniques to uh, for MEV uh, minimization. For example, 1559 ultimately does put a, a bound or, or does reduce the amount of MEV available essentially like the, the because of that in protocol burn. So there's potentially, this is a very like exciting um, area of research, but potentially there are other types of techniques that uh, may make its way into the protocol over time. There's also, I mean, there's, a, there's a security component here. Um, the classic Bitcoin issuance model is not sustainable, uh, hinges upon the fact that as the issuance goes towards zero and, and transaction fees become the dominant um, component of the block that it becomes uh, the mine on the head component of, of the protocol becomes game theoretically unstable. Whereas I might, you know, if I have 20% of the network and I see these like huge transaction fees, it might actually behoove me to reorg, try to re attempt to reorg uh, the head, even though I only have a small probability of doing so to try to get those fees. And what we're seeing uh, with, with the rise of MAV and that ratio of like, block value to block issuance go up, um, we definitely see some of those like similar uh, weird incentives pop up on, on the layer one security. And so that's like definitely a huge component of research. And uh, um, I wouldn't say quite a, a huge worry, but there's a lot of people thinking about this. Yeah. You interesting insight, at least for me, that reducing MEV might be a factor for decentralization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so it is certainly a concern. I think in a world in which you had you know, hobbyists couldn't access MEV and you had um, major institutions um, with pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into optimizing MEV, uh, that, that's definitely like not a good outcome for decentralization. Um, and so there's a kind of a huge parallel tract of research right now uh, on democratization and, and MEV minimization that I think is going to be critical to the security of the system in the future. Yeah, I mean, even if it's completely democratized and everyone w would get the same, you would still have the variance issue. So you would still then. Yeah. So you would have, um, you know, you would have certain, you do have those consistent payouts, which maybe keep your machines, keep your lights on, uh, but you would see these like larger uh, payouts. But so it's definitely, it definitely like the, the optimal of like having these like very clean, consistent uh, revenue streams uh, changes, it changes the, the calculation, certainly. So the other thing that Ethereum 2 is going to bring, albeit not immediately, um, is scalability with, um, with sharding. So for some reason, this is lumped together with um, the proof of stake transition, but it won't come live until next year, I'm guessing, at the very earliest. Is that correct? Later, for sure. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, the, the ETH 2, I think uh, I often say, is, is to increase security, sustainability, and scalability while retaining decentralization and this is so that we can you know ethereum can can provide uh, a secure and sustainable environment uh, for the world's decentralized applications at the crux of, of sharding at the crux of this consensus mechanism being able to provide more scale is really like sophisticated mechanism design and it turns out that it's much simpler to design these mechanisms when you have a, val when you have a, a, a participant set, when you have uh, a validator set, when you have like the consensus entities at hand to essentially like orchestrate and dictate through mechanism design. With proof of work, 
there's this notion of there's no notion of a validator set at any given time. There's no notion of consensus set. And so a sharding, which relies heavily on randomly sampling and, and validators and, and consensus entities validating subsections of uh, the system at any given time, really needs to know this um, this set. And you could imagine there there are like some proof of work sharding designs, but they ultimately end up trying to mimic a proof of stake sharding design in that. There might be some sort of like election into a set, like you have to mine for a certain amount of time and, and do a certain amount of blocks and all of a sudden you're in the set and then you can be sampled and it's much cleaner and much simpler uh, to just have a validator set known. Uh, and with proof of stake, we get that out of the box. And so really uh, the foundation is get a proof of stake consensus mechanism out there um, and then to come to consensus on valuable things. Valuable things are the execution layer of Ethereum today, the application layer and also more things, so, so sharding. So take this consensus mechanism um, and utilize it for the value of Ethereum. And there's really the prioritization here uh, between these two major upgrades, uh, it's the merge and sharding. The question was, which to come first? Um, and the really nice thing is that there are tons of scaling efforts, uh, layer two scaling efforts going on in parallel uh, to all of this layer one development. And so, uh, coming online today, and increasingly so, are these uh, these rollups which scale with the amount of layer one data um, and, and aim to provide like 10 to 100x scaling uh, for Ethereum without uh, changing, without moving to the, the sharding designs. Um, and so what we get to do is do the merge, which gets rid of proof of work, which makes the system more secure and more sustainable. Simultaneously, we get all these layer two scaling solutions, which makes the system more scalable. And then further down the line, uh, bring on sharding, which would complement these layer two uh, scaling solutions by providing more uh, more layer one data to to get even more scale. And so essentially, all these all these rollups are uh, they're buying us time, <laughs> and so we get to work on the other two components um, through the merge and then and then prioritize sharding. So essentially, if we did if we did sharding today instead of the merge, uh, we might get. You know, we get all these layer layer twos, and then we get all this um, all this scale from sharding, and but we didn't get the the increased decentralization, increased sustainability. So instead, we get to tackle them all at once um, at these different layers, and then enhance it further down the line. From your perspective, is it is it an option on the table that uh, it will stay uh, at proof of stake? That basically saying kind of well, we do the transition to proof of stake, but after that, L twos will do the job, and that's it. I don't think so, but uh, I mean, I, I don't get to decide. <laughs> you could imagine uh, some movement within the community being like, this is enough. Stop, stop messing with it. Um, and, and, you know, I think ultimately that would be it with, with 10 to hundred X scaling with rollups, like that would give us something. I think that Ethereum would be a very valuable and powerful tool, uh, but I don't think that it would give us the, the scale that much of the community has imagined um, throughout the years. And so, what we do have going on right now is there are sharding specs up in the spec repo. There are people working on R and D and working on prototypes. Um, I think even within the next few weeks, we might see like a very small like sharding devnet, uh, which builds upon the beacon chain and the merge. And but ultimately, like from an engineering perspective, like one had to be prioritized to the other, uh, or we just both would, would take longer. And so. Yes, there's a lot of unknowns. There's always a lot of unknowns, and and the roadmap and the technical specifications uh, have often been been in flux. And so, like you could imagine, in 12 months, something radically has changed. But uh, I do think that come the end of the year, um, with the hardening of the sharding specs and with increasingly some like test nets um, with uh, some of the people that are sprinting on prototyping, that we'll have like a, a good idea as to how this slots in in the next like 12 to 24 month uh, roadmap. Obviously, there's there's this thing we call ETH2, which is all the stuff we talked about so far. But there's also like tons of other shit people always want to do um, and prioritize. And so like it's it's a constant kind of debate and discussion. Um, other other things you might have heard of are like state management and state sustainability through like statelessness and other techniques, uh, which help uh, reducing the load of running a full node, which help with like clients, all that kind of stuff. So there's there's uh, a lot of different parallel R and D efforts. I think. I can say very confidently that the next major thing to go to mainnet will be merge, uh, the merge, but then post that, uh, it's kind of a very active uh, discussion and debate. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do another episode sometime about charting and the other efforts, just because, you know, th- th- having them like on the sites like this, it, it doesn't do them justice. <laughs> <laughs> but I do actually have a couple more um, very tangible questions on proof of stake. So who will get to determine um, the block gas limit after the merge? So the execution layer is like at the beginning of the merge is untouched. So the... Um, Essentially, everything dictating that realm uh, is ported. And instead of the proof of work miners producing and sending signals on that, it's the the proof of stake validators. And so in the construction of a block that has this execution layer payload, similarly, the the block gas limit could be dictated by by a validator than uh, by a proof of work miner. And so uh, that knob still exists. The block producer can still turn that knob. The block producer just happens to be a validator now instead of a miner. Similarly, like the 1559 fee mechanics, which are expected to go live uh, in the next couple of months, that mechanic at its core is in relation to the block producer, right? Um, And the block producer post-merge happens to be a validator rather than a miner. Uh, On on, on this topic, uh, I I really have a very high-level question uh, on on how, how we see, well, or how you see uh, Ethereum, uh, and specifically with this, um, yeah, question of what's the purpose of Ethereum, and is there potentially even a a, a conflict of interest? So what I'm um, talking about, one way to look at Ethereum very critically currently is uh, look at look at the high fees and see uh, users and applications paying currently enormous fees. <laughs> so one way to look at it very negatively would say, well, they got lurked into this chain they kind of started there (laughs) assuming well everything would be cheap and 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 free and currently they are getting the maximally rent extracted from uh, from 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 those fees uh and i mean that the the the, uh, narrative is is getting stronger around ultrasound money or kind of making a lot of money in a way with ethereum so to what extent or maybe what's 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 your comment on that or is, is there a chance to come to lower fees um or maybe even the question what what is l1 yeah i mean i'm i'm i i don't claim to be an ultrasound moneyist um i do think that uh these systems that the foundational asset of these systems must be valuable uh because these are crypto economic systems and they rely on crypto economic consensus models which generally are more secure when that foundational asset does have value and so i i get the push there. I mean, there's, there's probably two pushes there. Uh, some people are trying to make a lot of money, uh, but ultimately a secure ether, a, a highly valuable uh, secure ether does provide good properties to the system. So, but, but that aside, um, the crux here is ultimately capacity, um, which is supply. And there's, there's a demand, you know, has outstripped supply uh, quite a bit. And people really want to use the system uh, because of the network effects, um, because all the shit is there. Like you said, they've been roped into the system. That's where all the action's happening. Um, and there's also like a, an argument that, and maybe again, it's kind of the tail risk thing, but uh, the system's much more secure than other systems uh, by virtue of everything happening there and by the network effects and the value of the, the foundational mm-hmm. asset. Ultimately, we need to figure out how to leverage this secure uh, network for more capacity. Um, and, and there's a couple of techniques there we, we talked about earlier. Uh, but rollups kind of go into this realm of can we, can we use this as like a settlement layer to like a, an, a parallel system and leverage and get the same security out of it? It turns out that you, that you can. Um, and it has been a, quite a journey to, the, to construct systems like that. I think Plasma was like this promising thing. And we kept running into this issue of like, ultimately, like there's a, there's a data availability problem and, and there's all these like kind of ransom attacks and different issues that arise there. Um, and rollups solve that um, and are extremely promising to use Ethereum more as like a settlement layer to leverage its security to uh, secure much more and secure much more activity. Um, which is great. And then ultimately uh, sharding these techniques of random sampling of using uh, consensus participants in a way that does not uh, degrade security, but can come to consensus on more. Ultimately, like what is L1? I mean, L1's a, L1's a security model on a certain amount of capacity. 
and with with other with with a, a spectrum of decentralization. I think Ethereum thinks the Ethereum community, uh, the Ethereum ethos thinks that decentralization is is like a very critical component to the value of these systems and to the value to the world, um, and thus. All of those design decisions, that sharding, the how to get more capacity, ultimately like is unwilling to really sacrifice on decentralization. And thus, uh, it's taking time and, and it's difficult. And I think one of the reasons that a lot of applications and things are here is, is, is because of that ethos, because of that philosophy, because of uh, the value that uh, we think decentralization is going to bring the world. But we see a lot of like other competing systems that I think make diff- different design decisions, uh, especially on that decentralization spectrum, um, provide much more capacity. Um, and the systems may or may not have their place in the future. Uh, but I think Ethereum is attempting to build a certain type of future. And that's really the, the guiding light. And I think really, ultimately, the value proposition. Cool. Thank you. That uh, That was super fascinating. And I'm afraid we kind of have to wrap because of because of time, not because we've run out of things to talk about. Danny, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, where can we direct people to learn more about ETH2 or even join the effort? Uh, so there's this fantastic place called the ETH R&D Discord. Um, it originally was the kind of an ETH2 effort. And uh, then the all core devs, the, the Ethereum 1 effort, it all merged. And it, it's just this like fantastic, fantastic place to get involved in anything L1, Ethereum, R&D. Um, so check that out. You can find links on like the spec repo. You can, I think you can probably find it pretty easily. Uh, there's ETH Research, which is a, a, a more asynchronous forum to discuss uh, research ideas. There's the ETH2 specs repo where a lot of the magic happens on getting the specifications for this major upgrade in place. Um, and then there's the, you know, the dumpster fire of crypto Twitter, which you can at least like uh, find access points into, into all these different things. We'll link to all of these in the show notes. So uh, thank you so much, Danny. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate you having me. It was a, a fun and fascinating conversation. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guest or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>